distinguished guests, students, um, I'm honored, uh, I'm humbled uh, that I'd be called to be able to talk about our experiences and our adventure over the last little while. Uh, so allow me to share with you uh, what's motivated us, uh, our thought process and what we've been doing and uh, you know, where we currently are in, in this adventure. Uh, <clears throat> frugal innovation is a little different than how innovation is currently classified. If you look at any kind of tablet launch, a new product launch in a tablet category in the US uh, or in Europe, there's a focus on trying to create the iPhone or the iPad killer. So the focus with frugal innovation isn't about beating the features or the performance of those products. The focus is trying to create inclusive innovation that brings in the next tier of customer that couldn't afford that. And the idea is to create a product that would be viable to the rickshaw. Uh, there's a joke in my family where they say Sunit now wants to sell computers and internet to rickshaw allows. So never get in the car with him because every few yards he stops over, he pulls over the rickshawala and starts talking to him and starts doing a sales pitch on why he needs the internet. And they say, you know, and, and then they tell this joke and the whole family laughs and so on. And I explain to them, I say, well, it's the same kind of joke that people used to make not very far back uh, when they said that he would never have a mobile phone. People couldn't believe that a rickshawala would be able to have a mobile phone. And they asked this question, they said, yeah, but what's motivation? The mobile phone is different, you know? You need to dial some numbers and talk to somebody. There's a very small learning curve. And I believe that the motivation is education. What we leave our kids, the most important thing that any parent leaves their kids is an education. That's it. It's not about the land or the wealth or the property. It's about an education. And it's not something that we need to convince anybody of. Every tier of this society believes and understands that, and including the rickshaw. And if the belief is that computing internet access can empower a better quality of education for his child, then even the rickshaw will take advantage of it. The question comes up, yeah, but you know, there's, there's no electricity and, and uh, you know, where's the network to be able to deliver that access? Well, to us, the cell phone shows exactly that. The fact that he has a cell phone means he's figured out how to charge that phone. So electricity is not the barrier. The fact that he's a cell phone means he's got access to some form of a network to use that phone. So network is not a barrier. The barrier, in our opinion, is affordability. Why is that? important in education. Why is computing and internet access important in education? Uh, I'm a big fan of a fellow by the name of Sugata Mitra. Professor Sugata Mitra did these experiments called the hole in the wall experiments. And if you're not familiar with them, I, I truly recommend go to YouTube, type in hole in the wall experiments, and watch his TED Talks and look at the kind of research he's been doing. He did a test where he took a standardized math test Give it to a, gave it to a number of students around New Delhi. And the marks were around 68%. Then he went out 50 kilometers from New Delhi and gave that same test in 100 kilometers, 150, 200, 250 kilometers. And by the time he got to about 250 kilometers away from a large metropolitan area, that same test was showing results at 14% and 13% and 18%. And what, we, what he was trying to show was that the quality of education deteriorates in direct proportion to the distance from a metropolitan city, that the quality of education, especially in this country, is directly linked to your economic class. If you can afford it, you can afford a good quality education. And if you can't financially afford it, you are where 70% of India lives, a billion Indians in rural India, with no paved roads, good quality teachers don't want to go there. The absentee rates are horrendous. 
good quality teachers want to go where the living standards are better, where the malls exist, and access to electricity is easier, there aren't the same kind of security issues, and so on. We believe that computing internet access can impact that. How many students are there in India, and how many students should there be in India, is, is a figure that, that's sometimes questioned and up to challenge. There was a study done recently that said there's 220 million students in India. And then they did some randomized tests to see how many kids drop out in grades 5 to 8. And they found out that it was around 43%. And then they looked at grades 9 to 12 and saw 68% drop out. They said, well, if that's the case, and we extrapolate that, then potentially the number of kids that should be in school in this country is 360 million. Can you imagine that? 140 million kids that should be in school or not in school. But the problem isn't just that. The problem is that those that are in school get relegated to a quality of education that varies so significantly based on economic class that you sometimes wonder if some of them actually should be in school. Uh, one day I uh, saw my kids hovering over the computer watching a YouTube video and giggling away <coughs> Uh, they've searched the term Indian teacher funny and I've discovered since that there's a whole genre of, of videos on YouTube that uh, under this category of Indian teacher funny where camera crews have gone into the villages and have quizzed teachers and asked them questions and then they play this on national TV and then everybody gets a snicker out of the quality of that teacher I'll, I'll share with you part of one of these videos if you've never seen one of these, and, and then I'll give you my, my, my thoughts on it. My kids were giggling away, and I actually felt insulted. I felt very unhappy. I didn't find it funny. I felt, I, I felt, I felt sad for many reasons. The first reason was I didn't think it was right to humiliate anybody on national TV. I thought that was wrong. That that poor woman is on YouTube forever. Um, second was that I was born in India. I, I spent first part of my life in India before I went abroad. So I feel Indian. My kids were born abroad. So they feel foreign. You know, to them, India is another place. So to me, they were laughing at me and my home country, right? and that, that I found in something. But I found it sad that potentially millions and millions and millions of kids get relegated to that quality of education. And it's not because the teacher wants to deliver that quality of education, it's because that's all she knows, that's the best she knows, and the fact that she's actually there on that day is, is commendable because many of them don't show up. The problem is how do you solve it? You know, in India, we've been talking about the demographic advantage. We very proudly tell the world that China, because of the one-child policy, is now getting old, and they will not be able to compete in this next century. Europe and the US have such slow growth rates that with an aging population, they will not be able to compete. We've got a young population, and we've got a strategic advantage. Yet. Less than a few months ago, The Economist ran a front page story called it the angry young Indian. You can have a demographic advantage, but if you don't educate that demographic and you don't create enough skills training, then they do not contribute enough to the economy. And if they can't contribute to the economy, then it becomes a demographic time bomb. And that's the reality that we're facing in India. We think one of the best ways to impact that is the flipped classroom. 
I'm not a big believer in magic bullets. I don't think that one piece of the puzzle solves the whole puzzle. We need infrastructure, we need better quality teachers, we need lots and lots and lots of things to happen. But one of the things that we can do very, very fast is use computing and internet access to deliver and empower the quality of education that's there. And how is to use something called a flipped classroom. A traditional teaching mechanism is that a teacher is mostly a lecturer. A teacher comes in, lectures, some students understand it fast enough, some don't, some don't comprehend at the same rate. Then the teacher gives you homework, you go home, and in doing that homework is where you do the real learning. You ask your siblings, you ask your parents, or somebody's got computers, and you learn in solving the practical problems that they give you. Not in the classroom. You don't learn as much in the classroom as you do by doing that practice. Think of how we teach a child how to ride a bicycle. We explain it to them. You know, that's the lecture part of it. That doesn't do it. Then we coach them how to do it, and then they practice, and then they practice, and then they practice, until they get it right. The most successful form of teaching is how we teach a child how to ride a bicycle. Most people finally end up learning how to ride a bicycle. And that's the way the teaching should be done. So flipped classroom suggests that instead of giving the child homework after the class, give him homework before he enters the class, and the homework is him watching or her watching a lecture video ahead of time, and in class, they do the practical examples that they would have done otherwise. And the teacher now, instead of becoming a lecturer, becomes a coach and can individually interact with the kids and support areas where they have difficulty. The advantage of that model is that the quality of the lecture is independent of your economic class. You create the best teachers with the best way of explaining those things. I remember how I was taught human anatomy well, when they show it on a blackboard with chalk on what the body and the internals are supposed to look like, it has nothing to do with reality. First time I watched it on the Discovery Channel, I thought, wow, this is interesting. Think of learning photosynthesis or plate tectronics or those kinds of concepts with 3D multimedia and so on. So you have the best quality lecture possible ahead of time, and the classroom environment becomes the practical become the practical engagement, the practice that's necessary. This is the riding the bicycle part of it until we succeed in how to do this. And computing internet access is the way of delivering this. So this became our mission. We said, this is the problem that needs to be solved. And we're not a charity, we're a business. We're going to solve this problem in a profitable way and generate a business opportunity for this. What really matters, though, in able to do this is you've got to solve the issue of affordability. And I want to sort of share this chart with you, which shows internet growth versus cell phone growth. Globally today, we have 5 billion people using 6 billion phones. We have a billion internet connections being used by 2 billion people. There's a 3 billion person gap. And that gap primarily exists because of affordability. There's three million people in the world that have cell phones, hence have access to electricity, and have access to network, but cannot afford computers, computers and internet access, and as a result, are not internet adopters. And that problem can be solved through affordability. We did an internal study to try to figure out, well, what is affordability? What is the right price point that is appropriate for this market? And we said, well, let's look at the US. In proportion to their salaries, at what stage did PC penetration really take off in the US? And what we discovered was that it happened sometime in 1998 or 1999, and the cost of the average computer dropped below $1,000, and that was less than about a week of salary for the intended customer. And the moment it dropped to within a week of salary for the intended customer, it really took off. Well, we said, does that apply to India? And we mapped the same kind of thing. And we looked at average prices of cell phones. 
and said, well, what happened at what stage was the average price of cell phones when it really took off? We discovered the same thing. That is somewhere between 2,500 to 3,000 rupees when the phone started to drop at that kind of price point. And we said, well, how does that apply to India? And what we discovered was that for a billion people, that is a week of salary. That for 70 to 80 percent of the population in this country, when the phone dropped within a week of salary, it started to get mass adoption and then kept dropping and dropping and dropping. But that was the trigger point. And then we decided that makes sense. We've got to figure out how to create a computing internet solution to within a week of salary because that is what will drive adoption. Not everybody believes in this. We get lots of detractors. We're, we're part of a project that is sponsored by the government. So if you're the opposition, your job is to oppose. Um, and certainly, there are many people that, that don't have a lot of regard for how the government handles projects. So that's another reason to oppose. And, and it's, it's interesting to see the level of um, uh, detractors that exist out there. But in my mind, they're the same people that 10 years ago would question if the cell phone would get mass adoption. The reality is shown by this cartoon that somebody circulated on Facebook a few months ago. And the cartoon asks, uh, shows this uh, cleaning lady uh, and she's told her boss and that she's not going to be there. And her proof is that uh, the boss's the spouse has linked and put a like on it or whatever and confirmed. So she's got a feedback mechanism that shows that she has taken time out. Today it's funny. I guarantee you that in the next three to five years, It'll be commonplace. This will not be funny. When I used to talk to Rikshaw Balaz about cell phones, my family used to find that funny. Now, if somebody tells you they don't have a cell phone, you'll call them a liar. How's that possible? You don't have a cell phone. Everybody has a cell phone. The same thing will happen to internet access the moment the affordability gap is broken. The other way I sort of prove that this is going to happen is I said, well, look at China. My estimate of where internet penetration will reach in the next five years or less is at around 560 million people. And they said, well, that's a big number. How do you get to 560 million people? I said, I look at countries like the UK. They have 100% cell phone penetration, and they have 70% broadband penetration. So whatever range we reach on cell phone penetration, expect that internet penetration will be 70% of that. We have 800 million people that use cell phones. 560 million will use the internet. And I think it's not 10 years from now. Watch, three to five years maximum, maybe faster. And I said, well, I can prove it. You look at China. China today has more than 500 million internet users, and India should be able to keep pace with China. They say, yeah, but China, you know, China is China, you know, it's special. Um, but history proves them wrong. Because while there's a 5x differential in internet penetration in India versus China today, the same kind of differential existed in 2006 for cell phones. Today, that gap is negligible. When the affordability barrier got broken, you saw mass adoption of the cell phones in India, and you'll see that here. So to us, this is what frugal innovation is about, is being able to create a good enough product that meets the right specs and features for the right target market at the right price point. It involves not only a hardware solution trying to create and break the price barriers, but it involves unique business models, it involves technological breakthroughs, it involves disruptive business models. I'm going to talk a little further about the concept of good enough, um, but I'd like to request my colleague to
just pass around a couple of devices that are there uh, so that you guys can get a sense of it if you've not played with one of these, these devices. So the first aspect was trying to break the price barrier. Um, when you design for cost, your mindset is very different than when you design for features. We designed for cost. We said, well, these are the core features we think our customer needs, and anything and everything beyond that, we will discard. I'll give you an example of a common feature. Almost every tablet you buy out there will have an HDMI port. Our entry-level tablets do not have HDMI ports. Now, that's a 40 cent feature, 40 cents. But you know, 40 cents, my profit margin, the channel's profit margin, the duties and taxes has a multiplying effect. We don't put that in. We don't put an HDMI port because my target customer doesn't have TVs with HDMI output that he can use with that HDMI port. It's a feature I don't care about. You walk into an average store that sells tablets, you find a tablet that doesn't have an HDMI port, it would be very difficult. But for us, designing for price first becomes very, very important. 